All right, we are live. Welcome to another episode of the Ten Horse Money YouTube channel, Monday Night Live. Uh, no JB tonight. Uh, JB is just, we were just talking about baseball, and JB is a coach for his son's baseball team. And he's about 20 miles away doing uh, doing their first, I don't, I don't know if it's first practice, but one of the first practices of the gotcha. year. And uh, so there's just kind of a last minute deal where his partner called him Saturday and said, hey, we got practice on Monday. So he'll be back next week, but no JB today. Um, yeah, on the other end, we got Brandon, man. What's what's going on? How, how's it going over there? Man, I'm still exhausted. You know, I've uh, <laughs> I think we we touched on it a second ago, but like, I'm I got a full time job still. I coach two travel softball teams and try to fish a little bit on the side here. So, uh, uh, you know, when, when I got home from the Pickwick tournament, which home was not far away, but I was completely exhausted, and then I had to go back to work Monday. And while everybody else in the country fishing world went to uh, went to the classic, and I, I still hadn't caught up. We've been playing softball every every weekend, and I'm I'm beat at all times. So, yeah, I knew you're a busy guy. What do you? What kind of job do you do? What's so I do medical sales for uh, Gentiva Hospice. Okay. Um, enjoy it, man. I mean, it's a cool gig, and they're they're awesome to let me off work uh, enough to. Enough to do this. I've, uh, you know, I've had some buddies that fished the all nine opens last year and was, you know, talking about it this year. And I was like, I can't get off nine weeks, but I can swing six or seven possibly. So it's pretty yeah. cool, though. Yeah, that that's a that's a nice thing about the the MPFL is it's you know, no doubt kind of spread out. If if you're a guy that likes to fish, you know, 20, 30 tournaments, you can do that. But if you're a guy that has a full time job, that's you can right. still work and do the do the coaching and all that stuff. Man, oh, life's yeah. busy. It's hard to, I got all these tournaments I want to fish. I mean, I, I got a oh, full time yeah. job as well. It's like my buddies are always asking me, Hey, let's jump in this tournament. Let's jump in that tournament. It's like, you got a wife, kids, you got a full time right. job. We're building a house. Um, oh. And it just, I got all these things I want to do, but I just don't have the time to do them. And right. you know, maybe when I retire or something, that's right. That's what I keep good. saying. I need to win a couple more so I can maybe one day, but yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Oh, congratulations on the win, by the way. Well, I appreciate it a bunch, man. It's a, it's a neat deal. Um, you know, it's hard to win anything. It's a, I fish. I grew up, cut my teeth, I guess, fishing a lot of these night tournaments, evening tournaments up here at Pickwick. And I mean, I always tell people like, you got catching pretty good to win one of those. And I've I've been fishing forever, and I've never won a BFL. Like, I've probably fished 40, 50 of them, never won one. I mean, it's hard to win stuff, and. Fortunately, these last two MPFLs at Pickwick, I've, I've pulled it off. But, I mean, I, I understand of all people how difficult it is to win a big tournament. So, Yeah, so what – that's interesting. So a BFL, you know, it's a one-day tournament. You right. Can, you know, you don't, you're, not, you're not trying to save fish. You're not trying to – you know, you kind of go all in and just catch everything you can. How how's that differ from, you know, a three-day tournament besides, besides the obvious there? Are you – do you find yourself like, do you have like a goal, like a target weight on day one? If you get to that weight, then you maybe kind of lay off of them. How do you approach that? I do. I, I typically will kind of, and there's been times where I've went and traveled somewhere and, and after practice, I've been so lost that I, I had no concept of what kind of weight it was going to take. Cause I'm like, I'm lost. But when you figure something out and maybe got a buddy that's from there, that's fishing the tournament, that'll, Fill in a little bit on because there's there's times in the MPFLs and back in the day that strand coast of Toyotas where I would know somebody that was fishing it maybe local from there and I would say hey what what am I shooting for here but once I get you know at tournaments here I kind of know typically ballpark weight up for that time of year what it's going to take and I'll I'll set a goal now I'm not I'm not gonna Vaughn Metz what's up man um, <laughs> I'm not gonna you know, pull the plug on something if I'm having a fire day, but like day one at Pickwick, I felt like, I, I think I said beforehand, 65, if somebody catches more than 65, then I'll shake their hand. Cause I, I knew based on practice, man, it was, it was tough. The conditions were tough. The water was falling. It was getting, water was a little colored up, a little stained up. And the water temp had fallen too. So I knew the weights weren't going to be quite what everybody was predicting, but I still know that, you know, Pickwick in March is pretty dang strong, but I, I didn't, you know, I didn't go in and say, Hey, I'm cutting it off at 20 pounds on day one or 22. Like 
I, I got down to my more my end of the lake that morning and I started catching some some quality fish and then I, I'm sitting there culling and I'm throwing back four pounders and I said I'm I'm done with this now I didn't stop fishing I went and fished like some big fish places trying to catch just a giant and that didn't happen but I mean I do the mental difference in fishing a multi-day tournament three-day tournament one thing I do love about MPFL is everybody fishes all three days and I think it's cool because you can stumble, not necessarily zero, but you can have an off day where you weigh in 10, 12, 13 pounds and still contend for a win usually. Um, I like I like fishing multi-day tournaments more than just a one-day tournament because I feel like everybody can, you know, anybody can get lucky and stumble on something crazy, especially in the month of March and just wreck them one day. But I don't know that that's possible to go three days in a row on something. So. I like for me the way that I fish, the style that I fish. I like the multi-day tournaments, man, where you can you can put stuff together and kind of figure stuff out on the fly. So, yeah, and like a two-day tournament, like I fish some of the Toyota series, and who's to say that like right there in the last couple hours you start figuring something That's out? Right. Like thing, things are changing. You've been yep. trying to you know you've been hunting the pack and trying to figure it out, and then you get a little glimpse. And if it's a one-day tournament, it's done. You know, you're right. You, that's right. You're gonna have to wait a whole another year for those same conditions. No doubt. That's that right. Toyota, and who knows? You might wait 10 years for those same conditions to roll back. Yeah. That's the magic of fishing. It's like uh it is every single day is different. It's it's nuts. It, it I mean totally is may, maybe I, in the I, middle of winter or the middle of summer, it might be right. really consistent, but like right now, this time, everything is yep. changing. We got so many fronts and always rain. I mean when I when I first signed up for for this Pickwick for the whole MPFL schedule, looking at the dates of the Pickwick tournament, man, I we the conditions we got for the tournament were as far away from what I thought that I needed in order to win. Like I, I wanted no rain, I wanted clear water, I wanted to throw a jerk bait, I wanted, you know, currents fine, but if we've got no rain, then you don't have current. So typically what I was looking for was like no current, clear water, and not a bunch of rain, low water. And we got almost the opposite of that, minus the, the water did fall, but they were ripping current. But so it's crazy because I signed up thinking I was just praying, like, please, no rain. And then, oh, dude, leading up to the tournament, three weeks, two <laughs> weeks, I'm like, I'm in trouble. So, but it, it worked out. It's wild. Um, you know, it's wild how, I mean, I, I It is, it's neat because what you think you need and want isn't necessarily what the plan is, man. And that's, to me, that's the cool thing about it. And and when it's your time, I, I don't know that you can do anything. I've had times where I felt like, hey, it's, it's my time. And then that's based on practice. And then all of a sudden in the tournament, it's like, you know, it ain't my time. You can tell that pretty quickly, but um, it's neat. Uh, I, I enjoy I've had a heck of a time. I know you and Al are big buddies, right? And yeah, I've, yeah. I've enjoyed the heck out of fishing the MPFL. That whole bunch, man, they run a great show. Um, I mean, I fished a lot of different trails. And the way that they operate and get boats in and out of the water, and, and I mean, you can, they're good at what they do. And and I'll continue to fish with them. I've, uh, I really have enjoyed my time with them. Yeah, I think... It, it's like we we fished a turn. I fished the Lake of the Ozarks tournament over the week. It was just a one day tournament. We, we went yep. down there and fished Friday and Saturday. And you were talking about sometimes you have a, a good practice and the tournament just totally flips upside down on its head. And that's kind of we we stumbled across a little jig bite. There was a good solid jig bite going on. We had five or six locations where we had went through and caught a keeper or two, got a good bite. You know, kind of let them swim off right. and just shake it off. And we had and, and there was bait in all these areas. Well, tournament morning, we start going to these areas and the bait was gone. Like gone. the wind was out of the south on Friday. Then it went out of the north on Saturday. Yes. And then it went back out of the south on tournament day. And so we were trying to put stuff together because we already had a nice rotation in our head. and right. stuff. And it wasn't it wasn't working. Just so everything different. Yeah. So like going into Pickwick, um, how was your how was your practice for that tournament? Uh, so pre-practice was. In the MPFL, we've got – there's a pre-practice period that uh, I think it's like 21 days prior to the start day, you you can't be on the water anymore. So the last time that I could fish Pickwick before the cutoff was three weeks prior. And 
I fished it two weekends in a row. I fished Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. And I had two awesome days and one not great day, but it wasn't the worst day ever. And then I had one, the very last day of practice was, uh, I did not catch a keeper bass that day. Oh, now it's hard to go. I was like looking, that. I, I knew that, Hey, whatever I find in pre-practice is not necessarily the deal. So I spent the whole day looking for grass. They were pulling 170,000 at the time, which is insane. And they're not yeah. typically going to be offshore. So I spent a lot of time looking for grass versus trying to actually catch fish, but it got to be, you know, four or five o'clock and I was, <laughs> I was struggling and I was like, look, I can't, I can't sit at home for the next three weeks and remember a day where I did not catch a bass at Pickwick, basically. And I went and ran some pretty good stuff for the last two hours and still didn't catch a bass. So, it, you know, but the official practice, we get um, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And this tournament was a little bit different because usually we have Wednesday off. But this this past tournament, we had Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of practice. And Sunday, I put in down here on my end of the lake, which is the lower end, the uh, counts and uh, Pickwick State Park. And I had an awesome day on Sunday. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know what my best five was, but it was, it was strong, strong, strong. Like I felt good about kind of what I'd figured out. And honestly, it shocked me because my end of the lake the last few years has not been as good. And it, it was pretty awesome. It felt like the old, the good old days, basically. And then the second day of practice, I went up and fished the Florence end. I, I caught a couple fish, but nothing crazy. I mean, I probably had, three or four solid ones and then a few little keepers but i learned a little something up there that honestly i used on the very last day and then the very last day of practice i i ran some community stuff and it really shocked me that there wasn't boats on it because in this mpfl this year we got 76 boats small field putting in way up on the other end of the lake from what i typically fish in florence it, it spread us spread boats out and then wilson being being as good as it is there were several that locked to wilson so I was able to run community stuff on that last day of practice. And it got to a point where I was like, I need to chill here because I've, you know, I'm looking at a pretty good bag of fish and I don't want to blast them with no off day. I don't, I'm going to be running some of this same stuff tomorrow, but based on practice, I was excited and really, really nervous going in because I know like we just talked about how frequently stuff changes in the month of March pre-spawn, uh, you know, and, and what I caught was smallmouth and at Pickwick, Small mouth will burn you sometimes. It's about like we talked about Bay Springs. It'll 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 burn you some. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, hey, I'm winning this thing, but I was optimistic going in for sure. Um, and, and based on those conditions that were leading up to it, with like I said, the the weekend before our tournament started or our practice started, the water was two foot above summer pool which is 414 so it was like 416 and change and then during our tournament it was 409 so it's oh. the water dropped seven feet which i do think honestly played in i i think i would have caught them decent either way um because i do like when that water gets up some but i i think it played more into my favor because when they dropped the bottom out of it a lot of those fish that were up on the bank pulled out a touch and it kind of helped me out but you know conditions lined up perfectly and uh you know, we, uh, it, it worked out, but it was definitely a stressful week. It's fishing. I don't know if I'm cut out to be a pro angler or what, because I, <laughs> I value my sleep and fishing at home for some reason, the stress, I, I can't handle it. I don't sleep all week. And, um, you know, being away, even, even at the first one here that I won in 21, man, it was, I, I, I don't, I don't think I slept all week and I was even sleeping in my own bed. It's just, I, I, the pressure that you're supposed to win this is your home derby like it i don't like it i don't i don't like it at all so it's hard to sleep before a tournament i don't know oh, it is it's a especially ten... if you're on them man if you're not catching yeah. crabs, you're like, let's just go to bed like but <laughs> if you're catching them it's hard because there's so much stuff running through your mind like hey are they gonna stay or what am i gonna need what if they don't what if they're not on my starting deal or where do i need to start like there's a lot of decisions man that i don't think you know like a, a regular old Joe that just fun fishes and stuff. I mean, they they don't know how good they've got it as far as the mental side because there's no pressure to just go fun fishing, man. But all the stuff that runs through our brains is uh, it's crazy. I put it, I put too much pressure probably on myself at home. I don't necessarily. If I go to Wright Patman, I'm I'm looking forward to this next one coming up at Wright Patman, but I'm not 
I'm not putting a ton of pressure on myself. And part of that rolls back to, Hey, you just won a hundred grand. So you can stink the rest of the year and still be all right. But right. at the same time, you can go have fun the rest of the year. And if you win another one, then, you know, way cool. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the schedule though. You know, I didn't, I didn't just sign up for, let's see here. Oh, oh there is. Yeah. He just tried, he just caught a five, seven, five. He's up on Kentucky Lake. So, same river channel. I've heard it's making a little bit of a comeback, man. Smallmouth is strong up there. Smallmouth small mouth small. are really strong up there right now. It's, and I've I fished Kentucky tons back in the day. And when that largemouth population was up, you, I, I mean, you saw smallmouth, you caught some in the spring, some in the fall, but never like, you know, 12 months of the year type deal. But it's it's strong. It's up. But, yeah, it, it's yeah really making, the, the weights have been a lot better. The last it, tournament was a little bit tough because right. uh, I fished the BFL down there last week, right. and it was off. It was right. off, but that was – we had like two or three inches of rain right there, yeah. cold front type of deal. It was just a bad day. Even at Lake of the Ozarks that same week, it was – the weights right. were really low. So, but it's, uh, yeah. it's definitely made an improvement from a couple years ago. I'm hoping so. It Honestly, it used to be – and people don't believe me when I say this – I, I love offshore fishing, or definitely used to. Now in a tournament, it's it's pretty good bit of a headache. There's old JoJo. What's up, man? That's a Kentucky Lake dude there. Oh yeah. Um, but it, Kentucky was my favorite fishery. It, even offshore, post spawn, all the ledges and all that, it fished way bigger than Pickwick. I mean, you look at Pickwick and you, in its prime, you go scan around when when structure scan all that first came out and like. You know, you could scan the whole lake for a week and you've got 53 schools of fish. And at Kentucky, you could seriously find 50 schools of fish in a day. Uh, it, it it was insane. And it was my favorite place to fish. And the last time I fished it, me and my buddy Kelly Reedheimer went up there and fished. I forget what it was, some kind of ABA team deal or something. And it was probably July or August. And we we it was probably the only time in my life I put it on the rack early. Like I said, I'm done. I'm not coming back. Carp everywhere. Yep. It just was terrible. And I said, I won't be back until it's awesome. And I know that it's fishing substantially better. I still think it's got a you know pretty good ways to go. Um, but I hope it gets back. I honestly think that, that Kentucky being strong keeps Pickwick strong because it takes some of the pressure off Pickwick when a lot of those yep. in-between guys are spending a ton of time at Pickwick right now. And Pickwick, it, you know, it's still a great fishery, but it's, in my opinion, on a bit of a decline. I uh, don't know if that's tournament pressure or anything to do with carp or whatever. I honestly think it's just tournament pressure. Um, but I, I think Kentucky being good keeps Pickwick where it needs to be, where they both need a little grass. But, you know, I I love Kentucky Lake, man. I hope it gets back soon. Yeah, it's it's um, it's getting there. Like you said, I still think it's a couple years out. And boy, if they had some grass, that, that's yeah, all that's missing right now. The shad population's bag, the carp yep. is bad, are down. You got you know you got good largemouth, good smallmouth spots. There's actually oh, yeah. spotted bass are coming back in that lake, and it just needs grass. We're just right. it does just grass away from all it. these Tennessee Maybe. River lakes. I mean, you look at like well, I fished the Forcewood Cup in sixteen, maybe at Wheeler. And it was awful. And then now Wheeler is like, it's on fire. There's grass. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, grass on the Tennessee River for sure. Grass keeps that fishery healthy. And, it, you know, I don't necessarily like fishing grass one bit, but I love to be on a fishery or, you know, I, I understand all these lakes local here need grass in order to thrive. So I yeah. hope it gets some. Well, let's go. Let's go through the tournament. I want to go by like okay. day by day and just talk right. about, um, you know, kind of what you found in practice and then going into day one, did it, did everything go according to plan? Did you have to make some adjustments or what were your thoughts uh, going into day one? So, like I said, on, on my end of the lake that I spent that Sunday, the very first day of practice down here on the lower end counts area. And, and you're going pretty, out of McFarland? Did, did the we were, we were out of McFarland. We were out of Florida. Okay, so that's so, a 50 mile run, something like mm, that. Yep. Something like that. And okay. then this, this, this boat I got now will run pretty good. So I was like, Hey, I can make that run as long as it's not blowing. Um, pretty, pretty quick. Like, but I, I started up at, at the, uh, the dam area, horseshoe area on day one. Um, and caught, I left there with two and probably could have caught a couple more, 
but I, I was so antsy, like I got to get back down here to the, to my hometown area, like what I feel good about. And I ran down here and caught, a handful and, and caught some good ones and, and lost a good one or two like that that first day i think i had 24 nine and it it could have been could have been you know a little bit better than that to be honest and but i was thrilled with what i had and i i got on one little bar and i'm i'm working down it throwing a trap and i catch i don't know like a four and a quarter and it calls out a three something and then two or three casts later i catch another four plus and it didn't it didn't cool and i was like i'm i'm fixing to go fish big fish stuff the rest of the day like i went and threw a big spinner bait a big swim bait and a jig on some on some stuff that i, I in my brain i said where have i caught seven pounder in the month of march and i started running some of that stuff and i never called the rest of the day from, from probably i don't know 11 on and then i was sitting um yeah, I was leading after day one. I was, I knew I was close because old Brewer was pretty close behind me, and there was a couple of good bags on day one. Um, and uh, right there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at Al; he's he's blowing me up way too much, man. There's so many, there's so many awesome Tennessee River fishermen. I'll I'll always say like, if you look at those offshore guys, the best in the country, man. There's a bunch from Pickwick, but all down that Tennessee River, it's it's absolutely insane how good some of those guys are now. I do think I'm average at that. I, you know, maybe maybe even pretty good in some people's opinions. I think I'm averageish at it. Um, but I think that what allows me to have a you know have success traveling around fishing Toyotas and stuff is that just being a little bit versatile. Because I love when Pickwick water gets high and you can go flip bushes. Where a lot of those ledge guys are like, no, let's don't do that. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so then day two, I'm uh, I go out in the lead, but I got a short day on day two, and I think I had to check in at like two thirty, and started at the dam again, and uh, didn't catch them, didn't catch much at all up there, and got got pretty worried about it, so pulled the plug on it, ran down to my end, caught. Uh, I ended up with four by about noon, and um, the uh, the twins, Travis and Tanner. Uh, sent me a message and at that when they send you a message basically saying hey drop me a pin on where your location is in your brain you're like so i must be doing okay even though it's struggle busting and i've only got four i still had you know four for 13 14 pounds and what was wild is like i've never seen my end of the lake have so many smallmouth like we just talked about kentucky my end of the lake i catch typically a couple smallmouth per spring a couple smallmouth per fall and I don't ever catch giants and bunches of them. That first day of practice, my best five did not include a largemouth. I had really? four smallmouth and a mean mouth, and they were all on mine to the lake. Like I never, I stayed between Bear Creek and Counts. Um, it, it was well, they're, phenomenal. I'm bringing them down from the dam. Yes, you know, for way, sure. Way in at the, a lot at of the those tournaments park. are bringing them down now. Cause see, back in the day, Tennessee was awesome. Mine to the lake was was awesome, and it's still good offshore, but. A lot, every, I'm trying to think of what year it was. I don't know. It was 15 years ago, maybe even 15 plus. I'm getting old. Tennessee went to 18 inches on smallmouth. So a lot of these Toyotas, BFLs, college, high school stuff, and that all that was getting started had, they started going to McFarland. So a lot of our fish population in these summer tournaments were getting dragged all the way to McFarland. So my end of the lake suffered a little bit from that. And the last two years, our Hardin County Tourism Boards, you know, they've they've really stepped up and they've they've noticed the impact that having tournaments on this counts into the lakes had on our local economy. So uh, it's helped this end of the lake. I didn't know how much because, to be honest, I don't fish much. And and everybody always jokes around and says, like, ah, oh, he's pulling our leg. Like, I fished that many days last year at Pickwick. That many. Really? One. I don't, I don't have time. We just talked about I mean, I am... Yeah. And, and whenever man. I do have a free afternoon, I'm dead serious. I want to go take a nap. I'm like, I'm so tired from running these girls around. I got two little girls and chasing them, playing ball and working and all that. I'm going to take a nap over going fishing in the afternoon, unless it's the end of May. And then I might have to go fish in the afternoon <laughs> once. But that was the only time I went last year was in May. And I went and ran this new boat and stuff like that. But actually fishing, didn't fish a single tournament besides that one afternoon I went. And I didn't intend on fishing a tournament then, man. I went, 
I got off work early on a Friday. It was probably three thirty, and I was like, I'm fixing to go catch a couple. I've got the boat cleaned off, and we're fixing to put it in and catch a couple because it's like cranking season. And I put in. I ran a couple of community holes, and there was boats on everything because it's a Friday, and Friday's like the new Saturday up here, by the way. And I ran across an old school like used to be fire back in the day. Hadn't been a fish on it in six, eight, ten years, and they were piled on it and i sat there for probably 30 minutes and caught like a four pounder every cast or a stripe but every time i caught a bass it was a four plus and i was like i called my brother and said hey let's go fish the evening tournament this afternoon he said i can't so took one of my buddies michael smotherman and we went and won and got big fishing it and that was the only day i fished at pickwick last last year total like you made a count people do not people don't legit people think i'm lying about it i'm like no i don't i don't and that's another deal like why I was pretty hesitant to sign up for this trail based on, I mean, I, I've made, I fished two days in March in the last five years, probably. And now I've put a lot of time in, in the month of March, 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. I kind of know, you know, typically what to do. And I got some good buddies that are really good fishermen that, that will not lead me astray. They're going, they may not give up all the juice, but they're going to be like, Hey, there's grass in this stretch of the river and you need to be doing yeah. this type deal. And I kind of stay in the loop on what the fish are doing for the most part, even when I'm not going, but it's a, it, you know, it's tough to stay locked in when you don't get to go very often. Uh, I got, I got all sidetracked. Um, all right. but so then I think on day two, I was kind of at the point where I've got four in the box. And what's crazy is everybody thinks like Brandon caught all this fish at the dam. I did not catch a bass up there that second day, and I might have caught a bass, but I don't think I weighed one in. I caught on my end of the lake, the smallmouth were insane. So catch four, and then I head back up there, and I've got, I think I had to check in at 2.30, and it's probably, no, 2.45. And it was like 2.37, and I pulled up right there at like the riprap, basically, up just outside the off-limit stretch. Like, no kidding, I can see my family up here waiting on me to come weigh in because they know I'm checking in in 10 minutes and they never saw me. And I catch, I hook one. It's like a three and three quarter smallmouth. And I was like, please God, get to get land this fish and finally land it and put it in the box, slam the lid and idle in. And I was like, that's the luckiest thing ever. And that's goes back to like, Hey, when it's your time, it's your time. Cause I'm dead serious. I've never caught a bass in my life where I caught that three and three quarter. And it, it, it I didn't that's also never it. give up. You know, there's that's also never no give doubt. Up. Keep and I'm, I'll tell I'll say this, man. I fish hard. I fit, I practice hard. When I get to go, I fish hard. And it, there to me, it's not like an option. I mean, I, I sit here and look at it, and although it's not all of my money that's paying these entry fees and stuff like that, I'm such a tight wad that I will I I will. I wouldn't leave a tournament a day early if I'd zeroed for two days. It's just not my style because I know that any cast you can catch, you know, the big bite challenge, big bass and, and win your money back for the whole trip. And I just, you know, I, the never give up deal to me, I, I wouldn't even think of it like that. I'm like, I owe everybody I know. I owe them fishing my butt off as hard as I can go. And I was kind of in freak out mode, but it, it was cool. And then I think I had a nine pound lead going into the last day. And which sounds awesome, but knowing what I knew that night, like, Hey, I didn't, I didn't catch a bass up here this morning. My end was definitely more of a struggle and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I kept looking at the water flow, looking at the TVA app and I'm like, they're cutting the current back from what it's been. So well, again, you catch, you catch 12 or 13 and that's somebody right. catches a bag like you had on day one, no like doubt. a 24 pound bag game no over. Doubt. You know, back in the game. And, yeah. and I knew that that's in the back of my mind because I'm like, these dudes are good. I don't care what anybody says. I'll take the upper 10, 20, 25 percent of these MPFL dudes and you can put them in any trail there is. And they're getting checks and winning, winning right. trophies, winning shields right. like these dudes can catch them. You And you I mean, you look up and down that list now. There may be other trails that maybe those bottom 20 are awesome because I, I looked at the bottom 10 today from the, the Bass Pro Trail deal that going on at Murray, and I was like, golly, them some hammers down at the bottom. So I get that maybe somebody could argue that, hey, the bottom of the field may be. But I'm telling you, 
to win in this MPFL is is an accomplishment. To get a check is an accomplishment. I mean, some of these, most of these guys are really, really good anglers, and the others, I, I don't. I'm not saying they stink. I'm saying that to me, bass fishing and especially tournament fishing, you've got to take your licks before you can take some, right. you know, give some butt whoopings because you learn. All these guys can catch them, but you learn how to make decisions and you learn like once you get to a certain point on day one, you need to be working on what day two is going to look like, where what these fish are doing, where they're transitioning to. Like, are they going toward the bank? Are they coming out? Are they going, you know? So, and I think honestly, that's kind of what separates like that upper echelon of dudes from the mid range guys. And I'm trying to get in that upper deal, but honestly, I, in my opinion, I don't fish enough to get there but we'll see um so i go out last day and got a nine pound lead but still i'm not i don't feel safe you know so i go i start out up there at the dam and i knew the last day the wind was going to blow and there was so much stuff on my end of the lake that i had saved and i had not made a cast on since the first day of practice on sunday because i hadn't really needed it and I look at the forecast and I'm like, dude, it's going to blow. The wind is going to blow. It's going to be blowing against the current. And I know what that means at Pickwick or anywhere on the Tennessee river. Like it means tall boys. And that freaked me out because I, my last big, big lead situation where I don't know if you know, but like year one of MPFL in, in 2021, I'm leading AOI and going into that last day at grand and I pushed yeah. it, pushed it, pushed it. And, uh, didn't, it's not, I didn't do anything crazy that I wouldn't do again. If you don't trust your equipment, then you're not going to go very far. And I trusted everything I've got. I, my, I run the best products that I think are available out there and I trusted them and I got burned, but it's, it happens to everybody and still six, three braves, by the way. Um, but, uh, just with that what, in the back of my it? mind, do what? What inning? Uh, just just in through six innings, six three Braves. I, okay, I get all the alerts. But anyway, right. just with that in the back of my mind and knowing what it was going to look like, I wanted so badly to stay at Florence, but I wasn't confident in it. So I started on the spot where I started uh, the day before, and I stayed there way too long. And I caught one bass, but it was a good one. And I ran into one of my buddies, uh, Mike Corbishley, and – he said he, he probably honestly helped me win the tournament. Um, and I know we're not supposed to get help, but from a fellow competitor during the tournament, he said, Hey, look, it's rough down there, dude. I just came back from down there. I couldn't fish it. It took me, I forget however long he said, but it blew my mind from where he was fishing at. And I'm like, golly, I can't go down there. So I, I hung out at Florence and fished some stuff that I felt decent about. And I fished some stuff that I was probably completely lost and out of my element on, but it all worked out. Big Al says, go cards. We got one for I'll cards cheer for the for cards every now and then, Al, but not tonight. <laughs> go barbs. But, man, it was such a cool experience um, being able to win. Because the, the July win in year one that I won, it was um, – I, I expected to win that. Not being cocky at all, but if – that's my time of year. I like using my electronics. I like scanning. I like fishing offshore. And if I'd gotten beat in that, it wouldn't be the first time I get beat regularly. But against that field that where I looked at it and said, there's not a bunch of guys from the Tennessee River. July Island, Tennessee River stinks. And most people are going to throw a drop shot and finesse fish and catch 12 pounds a day. And I'm not. I'm going to power fish. And I may only get four bites one day, but they're going to be meat. And I expected to win that tournament. And this one, I had no expectations of that. I just, I knew that things needed to really work out and line up in my favor. And fortunately they did. And it was cool. Last day I had 24, four, I think, and one by 13 or so pounds, which was awesome. I, you know, I couldn't ask for anything cooler than that. But one thing that I will touch on, if any of my competitors are watching this at all, um, the camaraderie that, comes along with bass fishing and with this special group of anglers is pretty neat because the last day there was boats around and 
they're fishing against you. I mean, everybody's got a lot tied up and a lot at stake and people are fishing for checks and honestly fishing for a livelihood in a lot of circumstances. And how, the fact that those guys got crunk and legit cheered and screamed whenever I caught number four and five and said, I mean, I forget who it was. I honestly think it was probably Mark Schilling, but I don't, I was so amped up that I don't know for sure. But <laughs> somebody was like, I'm glad I got to witness the hundred thousand dollar, the first hundred thousand dollar MPFL basket call. And it was my number five. And it, it was cool. Cause it's cutthroat. This industry is fishing this tournament fishing is, but at the same time you root for your buddies. I mean, I, I, I missed that last tournament last year uh, with COVID and I remember watching it go down and, and Taylor Watkins is my buddy. And I, I just was like, it, it, if I ain't going to win it, I'm good with him winning it. And, and you know, my buddy Jordan Nettles that I travel with, man, I'm, I root for those guys and, and a bunch of the other guys. But to me, the sportsmanship, those guys showed, I'm, I talked to my wife about it and was like, you know, it's pretty hard to, to, to be in 53rd place and not catching them, sitting close to a dude that is and still getting crunk for him. But that kind of just speaks on the level of anglers that we have. Um, and, 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 even though it's cutthroat and very, very competitive, those guys know what's at stake. And I think they kind of felt my level of stress all the way from, you know, 100 yards away too. But it's pretty cool, man. We got a good bunch. So I, I want to kind of give those dudes a shout out and thank them for, for being cool and giving me a little space and uh, and honestly cheer me on. It meant, it meant a lot to me. That's good stuff, man. That's really good stuff. Yeah, man, that's the way to be. It's hard. It's hard. There's egos involved. And, right. And, but – the camaraderie thing, man. We're all going to do the same thing. It's kind, it's a brotherhood. That's what's it is. Tournament you go to if you fish a division for a while. Like I, I fish a lot of BFLs. Yeah, and you meet you year after year. You keep meeting new people, and you every time you show up, you run into three, right. or four, five people that you haven't seen. Maybe you know since uh, it's maybe it's been a year ago since you've seen them, and you get to kind of rekindle that. That's friendship. right. You end up Pretty staying cool. with traveling with different people, and it's a it's a brotherhood and man, the less negativity you can put in the mix, the better. Right. I was look. if I'm not having a good tournament, I'm always thinking, man, I hope, uh, yeah. I hope my boy's doing so good. You know, I hope yep. someone's no doing good. And I always look at, I always look at the standings, the results and I'm like, Me cool, too. he did good. He did good. He did good. And That's right. Me too. Even on like trails, I don't fish anymore. I'll, I'll scour through the results and be like, yes, my buddy caught him today. You yeah. know, but it's pretty it's neat. Fun. I mean, because I, I don't think everybody's like that. Like, I, I think the majority of people are. I think there's probably some haters in bass fishing like there are and everything else. But, like, I, I, we got a special group. And then it's pretty neat. Like, Jason Foster that I traveled with last year. Like, dude, that guy does a fundraiser for everybody local that bass fishes as far as just trying to raise stuff, raise money for them to help them out with expenses, battling cancer, or whatever it may be. So, you know, that to me is uh, – Pretty cool. We got a brotherhood and a sisterhood. I mean, there's a bunch of, you know, awesome women anglers out there, but yeah. this fishing community is tight knit and there's a lot of good people in it. And, uh, uh, but oh, anyway, it's, it's pretty neat. That's the one I want to click right here. I keep hitting the wrong one. So right. normally my buddy JB's over here and he's doing all the, he's working all the yep. stuff. It's hard here. to keep up, man. Cause they flash up there for a second and then they're gone. Yeah. Pickwick is good in the winter. It's Kentucky Lake was well, thinking about going down there some next winter. Is Pickwick as good in the winter as Kentucky Lake? Yeah, it's better. I, I honestly, I mean, Pickwick's got has to have more bass than Kentucky right now. I mean, Kentucky's in a down trend. I honestly think they're probably back more headed upward, but they're at a, a they've been at a little valley for a while. Pickwick's still really, really good, and the winter time is the time to catch big ones. Um, you can look at those Pickwick Winter Trail results, and and those weights are insane. Uh, it's regularly 25 to 30 pound bags. And a lot of those are brown fish in the mix. And it's Pickwick is strong in the winter time. I'm a sissy and I don't like fishing when it's cold outside. Um, one more. Let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to throw no, That's totally good, man. I'd love to take some questions. Huh? Yeah, let's do that. But I, I want to dive into after this, after this, uh, let's dive into, um, kind of the pre-spawn thing on Pickwick Lake. The okay. River, you know, the river, Tennessee River Lakes are different than just an impoundment. You got current to deal with. You got That's right. bars and that kind of That's stuff, right. which a lot of lakes don't have that. So I want to definitely 
touch on that and then some bait selections. Um, All right, let's what will pick, pick what be like in three weeks? Your guess is as good as mine, man. That's Jay. Yep. Honestly, there is so hard. I, I anticipate based on looking at kind of the upcoming weather because I'm leaving in two weeks to go to Wright Patman. So I've kind of kept up with the projected forecast, which is still sort of a guess. But due to what's what I know sort of been happening here and, and going to, hey, Darno, double to right, Olsen scored Braves eight, cards mm. three. Um, but uh, I, I think those fish will be spawning. I uh, I really think, and I, I think there's probably a few that are already up, definitely cruising, definitely probably even some postponed fish at this point. A really small majority, I would say, or a small minority, I would say. But I, I think in a couple of weeks, they'll be spawning. I think it's going to be more of a dragon deal versus right now, it's probably more of a rattle trap, uh, jerk bait, and things like that where in two or three weeks, I, I think it's going to be a Carolina rig and, you know, uh, Cinco, Ned, Head, stuff like that. So that's kind of what I would be doing. A lot of those fish are, I would say, pushing to the creeks and at least working their way there. Because what I think happens so many times on the Tennessee River, and those fish like, like to be on the river. Um, and I don't fish a lot of creeks, but the way that our springs are set up and, and this spring, especially early spring, late winter, early spring, we had so much rain and so much high flow current that those fish almost had to go at least to those Creek mouths just to get out of some current. They either had to get in a ditch or go to a Creek mouth. And that to me is what kind of set up the tournament in my favor. The one I just fished because I knew based on that much current flow, here's what I need to be doing type deal. And, but I don't think, you know, once that water fell back down, I do think some of those fish pulled out. But I think a lot of those fish probably stayed in those creeks. And so I do. I think we're probably looking at an early uh, a early spawn. I would say that in the next couple of weeks, they're, they're definitely going to be spawning all over the Tennessee River because it's been warm. And I just the only my only deal with not knowing how to exactly answer that question is, man, you can't tell a TVA. Typically around the middle of April, they pull that water up summer pool and it stays. But we may get two or three inches of rain soon. And I honestly think we're supposed to get that much like mm, tomorrow night or Wednesday, maybe here. And the water jump up. A lot of those fish pull up on the bank and start trying to spawn or get at least that process started. And then they'll suck the bottom out of it and the water falls four feet. And then they pull back out and have to start the process over. So yep. it's hard to answer, but pretty soon next few weeks, I'd be dragging something, be throwing a Cinco around a good bit. Yeah, that's the same thing that happens. I mean, you said Tennessee River, not just Pickwick, Kentucky Lake, yep. the same thing happens. Exactly. You know, there's been so many anglers that, that have preached saying, you know, why don't you just leave the water at a consistent level for one month? But you right. can't. It's flood, it's flood control. It's, it's right. It's, it's not, not for bad fishing. Do with the fishing. No, sir. Yep. It's not. It's, it's not, not for bad control. fishing. And that that's, goes back to a lot of those guys at, in our, our Pickwick tournament here locked on day one and they got they got in trouble because i mean not in trouble with the terminal organization like they got in, in a bind and couldn't get blocked back through and it's just such a risk like i think i told a couple of people even some competitors it can be one at wilson for sure and wilson scared me to death but i said i'm not doing it because i know that you can get in trouble but at the same time it's like those those uh tva will tell you like this ain't this is not for recreational you know your bass tournament seems cool to y'all but it's a recreational deal in our opinion so uh, all this barge traffic and regular business trumps everybody else, y'all's fishing stuff. So, but yeah, I mean, it would be awesome if they would pull that water up by a certain date, especially maybe even water temp and, and our fishery would be so much better if they could have successful spawns, but it's just not, it don't work like that. So no, unfortunately, anyway, anybody so, else chimed in with a question? Yeah. Let's see what else we got here. We got a bunch of them on here. Um, mm. here's Brock. We kind of touched on this, but, um, when current is turning on and off throughout the tournament, how far will the fish move towards the main lake pre, during and post? Um, they will definitely move. I will. So two, three, three years ago, you mentioned Brent Anderson earlier. So Brent's one of my good buddies. And I, in my opinion, one of the best fishermen around these parts and it ain't close. Like he's a hammer. So Two, I got three years ago, there was a Toyota at Pickwick in the month of May, which is a time that I appreciate. <laughs> like, I love the month of May at Pickwick, and I stunk in it. Like, I was terrible. And I missed a check. Like, I think I had 26 pounds for two days. I 
probably fished two hours the last day on good stuff. And then I got so frustrated that I went to the bank, started throwing swim jig. Like I was so mad because there's boats on all the good stuff. But those fish, I found a school in practice probably two days before, maybe three days before the tournament started. And they were giants, post foam fish, big ones. When we got a little bit of rain, they started pulling water and they, they cranked the water flow up from like 30, 40,000 range to like 70 to 90, maybe even a hundred. And those fish in that school moved from like, like a sneaky deal that I don't know that anybody would have found all the way to like a major community deal. So they'll move. And, and I knew where those fish were going to if they left there. But the problem was, and that's why I brought Brent up, like Brent knew where they were going to. And when I get down there on the first day, he's just wrecking on them. So those fish will move a ton. Oh, I'm trying to think of the rest of that question. But yeah, they move a ton pre-spawn, post-spawn based on that current because they're just not going to fight it. I mean, if you go up toward Florence and, and you can ask the guys in the MPFL or anybody that fishes current, 150,000 is a bunch, like almost to the point of, of dangerous conditions to, to be fishing without a life, ja life jacket on. So those fish are not going to set out in it. They might set behind, tuck in behind a boulder or get on the backside of like a current break, something like that. But like a lot of those fish are going to move. And then once I think post spawn, they'll move back out quick. I mean, I think they swim out in a hurry. Um, but pre-spawn... Once they go in, I, I, I'm almost sure it's not like, hey, I got it dialed in. I'm almost, I feel good about a lot of those bass at least staying pretty tight, pretty close to where they were. I think a lot of times if they drop the water down, they'll stay in that area. They just suspend and they get really hard to fish or really hard to catch versus them pulling all the way back out because they're heading where they want to go pre spawn. So maybe yeah, that answered that. Something, something I've learned uh, over the last couple of years about the Tennessee river is a lot of the fish just they'll spawn out in the main river. You know, oh, yeah. I always thought that they wanted to go back in, you know, sloughs and creeks and stuff. Well, it's the same thing with bluffs. <laughs> like, you know, a lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of uh, fish spawn on bluffs. It's kind of an overlooked pattern. There's people that fish bluffs during the spawn and do very, very well. Um, so they're it's not just, they're just, some of them live out there. They never leave. They just live out. I, the river. Do, I agree fish. with you. There's fish, and I, honestly, that's why I think some of those, like the Haynes and Lambert and the, those guys that have been successful fishing offshore up here, there, there's fish offshore here year-round. Like, they may be post-spawners. They may be pre-spawners. They may be – I we've I've caught them on a, on a, pl a big plug out deep. Uh, JoJo fished with Brent on day two. Um, yeah, well, I know where y'all were, but – uh, I do. I, I think that a lot of those fish don't necessarily go into creeks. The good thing is, if that's your deal of running in a creek, I like my brother fished a BFL this past Saturday and had a good practice. And I looked at the forecast and said, Man, I'm worried about you on Saturday because what you're doing is I don't think gonna play Saturday because the wind's gonna blow 25, 30 miles an hour and you're gonna there's going to be a lot of boats on top of your fish. Like what he was doing was pretty specific and I, I, he felt good about it and he's learning. He's just started tournament fishing and bigger stuff. And I think, you know, he zeroed Saturday and, and he, I think when he blasted off, he thought he had a shot to win and it's just mm -hmm. crazy how, how quick stuff changes. But like, so, so what, what change, what do you think change? You said people were going to be on top of his fish. Or so, I, the wind blew so hard that a lot of those river fish, um, people didn't even try for. Oh, Goldsmith homered to left. Um, yeah. eight four. But a lot of those, uh, he's, a good, play nine innings. he's a good ball player. That's right. Um, but a lot of those people, because I mean, Pickwick fish is pretty big in the spring. Like it really does. Because you, like you said, you don't necessarily have to be running in a creek. Like I fish a lot of main river stuff. And not even necessarily main river bank. I fish a lot of bars and I think they even spawn on a lot of that stuff. But I, I think just knowing I've had several good or several bad tournaments after good practices doing kind of the same deal he was doing. And I knew the way that wind's going to blow Saturday, it's going to stack a lot of boats up in these creeks and there's going to be boats, trolling motors, a rigs flying all around what, where yeah. he was trying to fish. And I think he was catching them out at where people's trolling motors were, but I knew that it's going to affect him somewhat. So mm -hmm. it, it's tough, man. It's hard. And, and I've, 
like I said earlier, I think you do. You got to you got to take your lickings before you can give some butt whoopings because you learn a ton. And, and honestly, I, I always there's a lot of things mentally and stuff like that that separate like a really good angler against an average guy. And I think those really good anglers, even after a sucky tournament, learn something and they say and where it's like a, there's a mentality of somebody going fishing somewhere and just totally crap in the bed and saying that's a gar hole i never want to go back or i learned something and i'm if i go back i'm going to get a check like i'm going to catch them because i know i figured something out or i at least know what not to do and i think that's part of the deal because i've taken my share of butt whooping so uh, yeah. But I think, honestly, that kind of builds you. And it's like that in anything, man. I mean, I coach these ball teams and kids, you know, two travel teams. And, like, you got to take your butt whoopings and you learn valuable lessons from doing it. So, uh, I think I think one of the keys to tournament fishing, and I'm, I'm definitely learning too, um, it's, it's been great to have these live streams and stuff, talking right. to different professionals out there and just kind of bouncing ideals off of them. And then fishing uh, – as a co-angler in the BFLs and stuff, I'm fishing, watch, watching people do, I fish local stuff out the front of the boat, but gotcha. um, it's the decision-making like when to bounce on your pattern, even though your pattern was working the last two days right. and it changes. It's like, so, so if you're throwing a jig and you're dragging stuff around in areas where you've been getting bites and all of a sudden you're right. not getting bites, what's changed. Okay. Right. Is, and you've got to be able to pull the plug. Yeah. Or the fish aren't feeding on the bottom. Maybe they're, they're suspended right. now or do they not want something drag slow they want a rock crawler or a slow right. rolling spinner right. bait they want that flash or they want that crazy reaction stuff and that's it that's the stuff you got to put together really fast and i always, um, I always joke around like three hours going down the wrong go trail. ain't no doubt you can waste a lot of time and yeah, that's eight hours back, goes by fast you know it goes back to my i like those multi-day tournaments i prefer those way more than just a single day tournament because Stuff does change. And and for a guy like me, if if I'm I've only got so much time off work. So if I'm I'm not gonna spend a week of vacation practicing for a BFL, in my opinion, because the the potential for winnings there just just ain't there. But now if you want to take a day or two, awesome. You can still break even or make a little money. But I just I don't I'll I basically if I fished a BFL locally, I'd practice maybe the Saturday beforehand and maybe one little afternoon and then I'd kind of be going blind and, and during that tournament is when I would figure something out. But I always joke around and say like <clears throat> my, my fishing partner, Kelly is, um, he's like seriously a genius. Like he's like one of those like ACT ballers and math mess brain is always rolling. And I'm like, Hey, dumb it down, dude. These are bass. I think you're too smart to be good because he overthinks everything. And it's like, I'm not scared to go do what was flowing in practice and just straight pull the plug on it because I know what happens if you don't pull the plug on that because it's it ain't working. It's pretty clear. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we'll go find something that is. And it may be, like you said, as simple as saying, hey, they were eating a jig. Well, they are not touching my jig, but I still am confident that they're in this area. Let's pick up a jerk bait and see if they're suspended or – you know, and that's what's cool about having the active target and stuff like that now is you can honestly troll around and until you find them. But, um, yeah. you know, being able to adapt and change is really, really crucial, especially in the spring because these babies move around a ton. Yeah, you, you'll you you'll run. So the guy I was fishing with doesn't have any kind of forward-facing sonar. Gotcha. So we were, we're, we're blind like that. But what, yeah. what you'll do is you'll run – you can get caught in that pattern running, trying to run a jig pattern yes. in six, seven or eight locations. You know, you yep. spend 20 minutes here, 30 minutes here, then you bounce and go somewhere else. And try and spend half a, a day. day. Yeah. Next thing yeah. you know, half a day is gone. And you're like, well, yep. let's just keep going that and keep doing this. You're already kind of spun right. out and it's hard we, to like, yep. that's exactly right. It's tough, man. It um, is. That's what makes it cool, man. And rewarding when you do catch them. And when you do figure something out, I mean, you got, it's like, baseball I, I relate a lot of stuff to ball and like you don't hit a home run all the time <laughs> there's a lot of strikeouts but learn something from the strikeouts yeah um, exactly and they don't all have to be home run cuts either man you can put the ball in play every now and then and catch a limit on a shaky head so oh yeah man uh perfect ledge on pickwick <clears throat> so yeah i mean honestly it'll be it, 
a current break. Um, so I typically, back in the day when when there wasn't a ton of pressure offshore on the ledges, like when all this structure scan stuff first came out, it was pretty simple to look at a, a I want to say a sea map. Sea map didn't even exist then, although they're phenomenal now. Look at a Navionics map while I'm idling around and be like, they're going to be here. And I think it was probably 12, 15 years ago, I seriously had a buddy going to Chickamauga and I'd never fished Chick offshore ever. And he was going to fish a Toyota, something, BFL, something. And I looked at a map and I sent him like 35 waypoints. And he calls me after a day and a half of scanning and said, hey, bro, there's a school on like 30 of these. How the heck do you know that? I'm like, well, I can just look at the map and tell. But it's to me, it's not once you figure out and I, and I give Randy Haynes so much credit because he was fishing stuff that opened up a lot of people and Lambert same way. But but Haynes, I, he he whooped some butt up here for a while. And while Lambert had rolled, moved on and started fishing the tour and stuff. And, and he, the fact that people saw him sitting on certain deals and then you ride by and, hey, I'm not hole jumping Randy Haynes here because he's a big old grown man that'll whoop me. But yeah. I look at my map and I'm like, I see what, the, what top deal he's sitting on. So then yeah. you can go run more. But basically a current break. So I do look for river ledges, creek mouths. But ideally, a major community hole will be like, creek channel that dumps out into the river channel and the down current side of it like simple enough there'll be if there's all there's current flowing on the tennessee river there is especially in the afternoons the feeding frenzy begins gets crunk and that's to me when you find them now during you know from daylight until one two three o'clock even they're hard to catch but at least you're confident that hey i know that there's a school that's fixing to appear here because they're kind of busted up up until that feeding frenzy gets ready to start. And then once that happens, it's like on, but it's not, you know, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. It's not crazy complex. Now here's where it gets a little tougher. All these people are fishing ledges nowadays. All these people have shared waypoints with their buddies and that buddy shared it with another buddy. So all this stuff is definitely community now. So then instead of looking for, the most obvious stuff, the easy stuff, the perfect ledge. I've started looking for schools close to community holes. So close to the obvious stuff where maybe those six or eight biggest bass that ain't stupid have pushed to. Um, and they may still pull to there at five o'clock in the afternoon during the feeding frenzy, but that's not necessarily where they're living at. So to me, that's where it gets difficult because the perfect ledge, in my opinion, 10 years ago is different than it is now. Like, the perfect ledge 10 years ago was simple. It was like, Hey, I can look at this map and I can tell you like they, there's going to be a school here and it still applies. But to me now the perfect ledge is like not necessarily a community hole. It's something that you might find that's fresh where they have not seen a, a lure yet, or it's been, you know, they don't get thrown at every day. And that's the hard part. A lot of straight ledge stuff, a lot of inner bar stuff, maybe between the bank and the river. And there's a lot of seat time, comes into finding those and honestly at times a little bit of luck involved because you can find some schools in some dumb places on the tennessee river i mean dumb places like i've got buddies that found really good holes that remain good every single year that found them while they were idling and they got a phone call and they're talking on the phone and they're not paying attention and they've idled off of the main river ledge on accident not even paying attention and found like a fire school and it's just it's crazy to me but it's like yeah, crappie, really, crappie schools. Crappie schools will just kind of wind up in yep. a random spot. It, and it some of these no bass are doing there. the same deal. They oh. really do. And I think it's because of the pressure. They get pushed to places. And now that's their new home. Like that's where they're going to continue to go, in my opinion, until, like I said earlier, the only day I fished last year was like middle into May, one Friday afternoon. But I, I caught them on a hole that, hadn't had a bass on it in six, eight, 10 years. And it was piled up. And then I talked to a buddy of mine afterwards and told him where I caught him at. And he said, Oh, that place is phenomenal. Like he said, it's the best school on the lake this year. And it's just wild. So once some of these community holes stop getting thrown at so frequently, 
they may go through a few year little downturn, but they'll they'll fire back. They'll they'll be good again at some point. What are what are five? We're getting close to an hour, and I know we were going to try to keep around. That's the right. Hour. Um, five baits that you have to have on your deck right now when you're fishing Tennessee River. I mean, you I got know, some laid out. House without them. I got some laid out right now. So I um I have I'm a jerk bait guy. I love, love, love throwing a jerkbait. I uh, do, you tie, do you use a snapper or do you tie it straight to the split ring? On I tie bait? that stinker straight to it. So, okay, gotcha. And I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not like, hey, I'm a jerkbait guru. There's a lot of guys probably way more schooled, more, more versed on jerkbait fishing. I just like it. I think I got a pretty good feel for it. And I liked it long before front facing sonar and all that. Um, so this time of year, I definitely would throw, would have a jerkbait tied on. And, then uh, the stuff that I've got laid out, a rattle trap, an old school rattle trap, Bill Lewis rattle trap, half and a three quarter. And then I kind of, I ordered a couple of new ones this year and they've got the, it's almost like a one knocker ish one. And they've got some neat colors that I didn't realize. I've always been a rattle trap dude. And I've grew up fishing Gunnersville, the rattle trap tournaments and all that kind of stuff. But like, I didn't realize they had, they've got like 40 million colors that all look good. It's like looking through online. I'm like, golly, that yep. looks good. That looks good. But I ordered, I ordered a few that look good. This one I've got laid out right now is a Cali craw. Um, if y'all can see that. Me, I definitely. Solo. I can put you on full screen here real quick. Uh, let's see here. There, there we, we go. go. And I can get a little closer there, but. Oh yeah. I, I'm obviously the the crawl patterns this time of year, and that one there is just just a regular old half ounce. And then um, I, I I crank a lot too, and um, I've got a six and a twelve, the Bill Lewis um, twelve the chartreuse blue back, and the six is here. But those two are are good ones. Um, That's good good looking colors there. I have that that one there is just a Tennessee River staple, just that chartreuse blue back and. And then the, another. How, how the has that been such a good color for so long? It's crazy. Dude, I don't know. It's crazy. And uh, that and like the the citrus shad looking color. Yeah. And people ask me like, they want to buy a bunch of funky stuff when they're coming to fish offshore, and I'm like, okay, so throw a chartreuse blue back in the month of May, throw a citrus shad for the first half of June, and then throw a green gizzard shad from then until September. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not complex. It's crazy. You know? It's it, it's that simple, really. I mean, it is. Um, and then a. Uh, I am I'm new on with Yamamoto this year, which is really cool because I have always thrown a little bit of their stuff. I'm all I'm a Cinco dude. I I, I I like. I mean, obviously everybody in the country throws a Cinco because they just straight catch them. But I caught a ton of fish on a scrounger head in this tournament and and this D shad. Uh, it's a fluke style bait. It's awesome. I had bought some before I went up north. Pull that, pull that um, out. What's that look like? I've never seen. Uh, so it's right here. Um, just it is a serious okay. uh, know, fluke style bait. It's uh okay. it's awesome. Put it on a scrounger, paired it up with that chartreuse a little bit. I honestly had a uh, chartreuse pin. I had one all the way chartreuse up, and I thought, boy, this smallmouth are gonna eat it, and I never had a bite on it. And then the uh, Buckeye ball head jig. It's a, I think it's a G Man one. I love it. I have thrown this thing since it came out. It's simple. It is there's nothing to it, and I think that. A lot of people, I mean, obviously it's a little finesse skirt. I love the brown and orange this time of year. Green pumpkin, anything works. But like to me, that's about as simple as bass fishing gets. And this head does not get hung up nearly in, in rocks and things, good gravel banks and things banks that you need to be fishing this time of year. And I've I've thrown that thing since it came out long before I was I was tied in with uh with Buckeye. I just I, I like dragging a jig around too. But honestly. I throw a jerk bait in a trap and if I have to slow down, throw a jig, I will. And, but I do, I keep my fishing pretty simple. I've got tackle galore. I've probably got $5,000 worth of mega bass jerk baits. And I've got a bunch of straight eyes from back in the day. And I'm like, I don't even throw them. Like I keep my fishing. I'm like a jig and it's probably going to be brown or green pumpkin and then a trap and a jerk bait. And then offshore, it's like, I got a jig, I got a scrounger and then let's, uh, mix in a big crankbait so yeah it's just all about finding those fish that want to buy it is those. and that's the deal and and to me i don't people get carried away on like hey what color you know what color trailer you, what you know what color yama crawl you throw on the back of that jig and i'm like dude it doesn't matter like 
I'm going to force feed them and make them bite. And that, again, we talked about those fish that maybe we found on a jig bite. Like they might get off of dragging it to where you really need to stroke it. Like, like you're throwing a spoon and I do that a ton too. But you know, I, I don't, I don't try not to overcomplicate. Honestly think I joke around with my buddy. I brought him up a minute ago, Kelly, that's so dang smart and he overthinks everything. Honestly think I'm just dumb enough to be pretty good at fishing because I don't overcomplicate anything. It's just like, just, it's a bass. I grew up fishing pond stuff and walking the banks, like throwing a, you know, a seven inch U-tail zoom worm and a little lizard. Like this yeah. ain't hard. They'll bite it. So there's guys that fish the, the BFLs um, that just throw a Carolina rig or they oh, just yeah. throw an A rig. Oh, and that's killer. And, and they'll, they'll be right up there in the angler of the year. You know, they'll be in mm -hmm. top. They'll make the regional every year just throwing a Carolina rig. What's that? You know, they'll make the regional every year oh, oh, yeah. just throwing a Carolina rig. Hey, I mean, or if your name's Tommy Pickett, Lloyd Pickett up here. Yeah, exactly. There you, you go. You uh, make the All-American every year throwing a Carolina rig. That's so right. There's a couple it's of pretty, them. Like it's that. pretty wild. I mean, I do. I keep it pretty simple. Now, I've got some of that high-end stuff and some, a lot of balsa square bills, stuff like that, but i don't throw it often i don't throw it enough to even justify buying it but you know we're tackle junkies so we got to buy everything pretty and cool and new so but it's i am excited about yamamoto's got that new yama tanuki deal and i've not really had an opportunity yet um there you go he likes to throw two jig colors too um i uh i've not had an opportunity to throw it but i've talked to some of the couple of my buddies that are fellow pro staffers a couple that i really trust and apparently this thing's gonna be the deal um flipping around and it's probably got multiple you know variety possibilities endless possibilities but i'm, I'm looking forward to flipping it a little bit so i'm looking forward to right patman but i mean i do i appreciate you having me on i know we gotta wrap her up soon but listen i want to i want to give a shout out to a couple of people if i got the green light to do that um Go right ahead brother so i was um Cause I know I probably got a couple buddies watching this and I'll share it and some will view it as they can. But like, I was not sure that I was going to bass fish this year. I had a stinky last year. So year one in the MPFL man, between contingency money and, and fishing MPFL and winning the Pickwick and second at Winnebago and getting a check everywhere else. I had a good year and made a lot of money. And last year stunk. I was, I, I sucked basically last year. So I was in contention at, two of them in my opinion after two days and then i bombed hartwell when i thought i was going to win it but it didn't work out and i thought you know i've proved what I, I i don't want i don't aspire to be like a pro angler don't want to fish for a living i got a really good job and i i i like i like my family time and my ball time there may be a time in life when i'm retired and my kids are away at college and they forgot who brandon perkins is that i may want to i may change my mind and go fish for a living but uh I, I didn't plan on even fishing this season and I had a couple sponsors step up and a couple buddies kind of talked me into it and I decided to, and it's cool. I, I could not do this without them. And there's some that's been with me from the get go um, outpost here in Pickwick, uh, the PCA paper mill here at Pickwick and family clinic at the lake. And then I got a couple of new sponsors, Southeast auto direct. I got, a, I got several like the, sponsors that are not necessarily tied up in the fishing industry i guess yeah, non-endemic sponsors yeah. yeah and but then as far as fishing sponsors i've had some awesome support um my buddy crispin pally uh was with strike king for years and i worked with him there um and and, and i was a fan of strike king stuff and still throw some of their stuff for sure they got some good stuff he's with uh gsm now with buckeye uh bill lewis and yamamoto and still shad some of those lines and He's added me on the pro staff and I'm super thankful for that opportunity because looking down that list of pro staffers, man, it's insane. Like I'm, I'm out of my league in that, in that deal, but I'm proud to be with them. And then I got a new rod sponsor, uh, right here, local, uh, rock hole rods. Um, that crew is awesome. They've, you know, I don't want to say like, Hey, going all in on me, but like they've, they've trusted me and said, Hey, we, we, we're going, we're going to help you out get us out there and man i've i've enjoyed throwing their rods and i got a couple of those laid out and i may even send you a picture or put it put it in the comments or something like that i've got a couple i threw their eight foot cranking rod that's what i threw that mr12 and mr6 on and i threw the mr6 on the 76 cranking rod but this eight foot cranking rod is phenomenal and then they've got a, a signature series uh swim bait rod that's my buddy foster on it and it is phenomenal I, and i'm a fan of a swim bait rod and i like that rod 
and then I threw a uh, jerk bait rod a lot, and then I threw a uh, trap rod. So they've got a lot of their their arsenal's cool, but I'm I couldn't do it without those folks, and I want to thank them. And then honestly, I know you and Al are buddies, like we said, but MPFL has been awesome, first class organization. Um, I don't know that I would that I would have fished this season even with these sponsors and this schedule without them kind of pushing me and and not necessarily like hey we need you it was more of a deal that's like hey you're a good dude you've you've done well with us and we want to grow with you like they're growing the same way that i am so mm -hmm. it, it works out it's a cool partnership with them in a sense but um you know i'm just blessed i'm i'm i sat on camera the last day i was like this is crazy to me because i'm honestly not that good at bass fishing i'm just blessed like god's so good to me and I don't understand it. I don't, whoever that chimed in a minute ago that said, this is my dude because he throws two jigs. I don't overcomplicate stuff. I'm not that awesome at bass fishing. I just drag around and catch one here and there. But it's been cool. You cannot explain certain things in life. And, um, you know, this is me catching bass is one of them, like, and, and being successful doing this. So the good Lord's been good to me. And then obviously while I'm thanking people, if I don't say my wife, she's going to murder me tonight. But no kidding yeah she has a handful while i'm gone and every dude that bass fishes understands that like mamas mamas are selfless and they do a ton so that we can run around and chase these bass or whatever your hobby may be and uh she does a dang good job but i'm appreciative of my family mom dad and that whole bunch and just the support from friends and family and stuff but and i'm thankful y'all for y'all having me on tonight man it's been cool i keep saying y'all there's usually two of y'all though so yeah yeah, man. Yeah, it was good, man. It was good hanging out with you. I got a bunch more questions. Sometime down the road, we'll get you back Dude, on. I will. I mean, down a little bit. I know. Um, I'll jump back on sometime. I, uh, I'd, I'd love to uh, catch back up. I mean, hopefully we can. We'll have another W this season, and we can recap it too. Um, most definitely. And then man. there may be people. If there's, if there's, I'll go back and kind of look at this. If there's questions, I'll, I'll answer some of them because I'm pretty transparent with stuff. I don't, I don't have a lot like i said i'm not real secretive about baits and tackle and equipment and now every now and then i'll get um i'll have a secret little bait for a minute but like right. that gets exposed pretty quickly like it, it's it's wild how i i guess social media has changed man because i you know they're at certain times you thought like the magnum spoon it when it got out man it was like fire you wanted to have your hands on them and just keep it quiet and then now that the world we live in that gets exposed like that so but yeah it, it's, it's a lot cool. of times it ain't it ain't the jig it's the person that's throwing the jig that's or right. whatever i do agree it, you know i think that you that. can you can throw the right bait and uh have a wrong presentation to it and, right. and i i don't even think that i know that because i had back in the day a fire bait way way early and uh before it was released top deal and i didn't catch a bass on it and then it got released and i saw people catching them on it and i was like i may need to give that a whirl again and started catching i'm like what was i doing i've had this for two years and i didn't yep. so yeah i confidence. do agree with you you gotta have confidence in it or you, you do know. you gotta have confidence so all right man we'll let you go thanks for hanging out with us we're gonna do as soon as you get off of here we're gonna mm -hmm. do a bait works giveaway for all these folks that have been hanging out awesome with us this evening awesome. um yeah, man. Enjoyed talking with you and good Same, luck man. the rest of the year, bro. Hey, thanks. I'm looking forward to it, man. I'll, I'll jump back on sometime. I enjoyed it, man. And good luck in your fishing season, too. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. All right. You too. Take care. All right. Thank y'all. See you. All right. That was good stuff, man. We'll do this again. I had a bunch of questions to ask him. I wanted. To, I really wanted to dive into uh, lipless crankbait fishing. Um, I know he does that a lot. And... There's a lot of subtleties to lipless crankbait fishing. I, you know, I kind of wanted to talk to him about the color red. Um, everybody goes to red this time of the year. And how important is that? Do they just bite red or is it, you know, they still bite shad color stuff? I mean, obviously I know they do, but it's like everybody is talking about red in the spring. I didn't see any more questions for me. Um, so let's do this Baitworks giveaway. We're going to give away a $25 gift card to Baitworks. And I was thinking... We're going to do it like just simple. Um, what was Brandon's day two weight in the 2023 MPFL Pickwick Derby? The one he just won a couple weeks ago. So what was his day two weight? The first person that guesses pounds, 
and ounces is going to win the $25 gift card. So appreciate everybody hanging out. Um, JB will be back next week. I think, let me, let me check these dates real quick. I think i got a really good guess for you. I gotta get the dates, dates right first. Yes. Um, next week, we're going to have Dion Hibden on because the following week is, or the week, that weekend is the Big Bass Bash. So we're going to have a Big Bass Bash special with Dion Hibden. We got a winner already. That was cool. That was fast. Let me make sure I got this. Yep. There we go. Bonfire fishing. 17 6. We're going to count that. 17 06 is 17 6. Um, so you're going to get, just send me uh, send me your email to Gabe Montgomery or Gabe Montgomery Fishing or 10 Horse Monty on Facebook and 10 Horse Monty 6 on Instagram. And I'll get that over to Brian from Baitworks and we'll get that gift card sent out to you. That's really all I got for you. If any, I don't know if you guys want to talk about anything, I'll give it a couple minutes. If not, we'll just wrap it up. Um, we fished Lake of the Ozarks yesterday. Mike Marfell and myself will have a video in a couple weeks on that. I got to, uh, I'm going to do that, that Kentucky Lake tournament, the BFL tournament, probably this Wednesday. And then um, I got, I got a jig video coming out Friday. That's going to be good. Just talking about um, orange, the color orange. I know we talked about the color red. It's going to be talking about the color orange and how, um, it's, I think, uh, on a jig or soft plastics or something right now, I think orange makes a big difference. And let's see. There'll be more, Daniel. There'll be more coming down the pipe really soon. We're going to give away one of these Baitworks gift cards every week, which is really cool. They've really stepped up and kind of sponsored the stream. And I got a couple more, um, Cumberland Pro kind of four packs to give away where they've got the new, the little, the runt jig. They got the Buckeye football jig. They've got the Bama swim jig and they got the pig jig. Um, Isaac sent me some of those to give away. So we're going to be doing those giveaways um, soon. Facebook page is uh, Gabe Montgomery, Gabe Montgomery fishing or 10 horse money. I mean, I got three different Facebook pages. So hopefully that'll work. And that's it. That's all I got for you guys. Hope everybody gets out there. It's spring, man. It's, it's supposed to be like 84 tomorrow. I know we got some rain and, and wind and stuff. We got a little bit of cold weather coming, but if you're, if you have the opportunity to get out there, get out there right now, cover water, the fish are up shallow and they're, they're dumb right now. This is that time of year where you can just kind of go about down the bank and just throw your favorite moving bait, you know, swim jig. Well, that's right. My bad, Rich. Uh, in the Midwest, it is definitely springtime. Um, so just cover water, keep your bait wet, catch fish. Jay, congratulations. Jay caught like the big bass. I'm, he's he's like Big Bass Beffa. That's his name now. I'm going with Big Bass Beffa. He caught the big bass in the Anglers in Action tournament this weekend. And then the first one, he caught the big bass. So he's got to get something to go with it. Same here. Um, Daniel's still got ice. Yeah, that's it. All right, we're out of here. Thanks, everybody, and we will see you next week.